Abraham, thanks for the uh, for the kind intro and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks also to my friend uh, Andrew Bremberg for the fine service that you did when we were working together in the last administration. You were our ambassador to Geneva, covering a lot of the international organizations that you saw autocracies trying to co-opt and corrupt. And uh, and you, you did a great job defending our interests and the, the founding principles that all those organizations were founded on. So uh, it's up to all of us to fight for the soul of those organizations. And you, you did that. So thanks for that. Um, I'd like to congratulate the foundation for the essential work that you've been doing, uh, and especially to recognize the work of Dr. Adrian Zenz uh, and, uh, and your colleagues who've done so much to document and expose Beijing's crimes against humanity, against Uyghur people and other minority groups. Adrian, uh, thanks, looking forward to hearing more from you and, uh, and congrats on all the great work you've been doing. Um, I've really long admired the mission of your foundation. And that mission is to educate future generations about the suffering inflicted on people by communist regimes. Your mission to never let us forget the atrocities of the last century is now compounded by new work. The essential task of documenting atrocities attributable to communism in this the 21st century. Back in the 20th century, communist regimes inflicted 100 million untimely deaths worldwide. The Chinese Communist Party accounted for the majority of those deaths. I'm sorry to report that so far in the 21st century, the Chinese Communist Party appears to be on pace to meet or beat its 20th century death toll. The difference is that the mass suffering isn't just kept within China's borders anymore. It is something that the Communist Party exports. For example, The Economist last week estimated that 27 million people have died worldwide as a direct or indirect result of COVID-19. The regime that rules China is at least partly responsible for those deaths, at least. Recall that in late 2019 and early 2020, communist officials detained and muzzled doctors who raised the alarm about a mysterious outbreak of severe pneumonia in Wuhan. Authorities covered up the cases. Then they blocked the sharing of samples with other countries. They provided false assurances about how contagious the virus was and they channeled misleading data to the World Health Organization that downplayed the virus's unusual efficiency at spreading through the air from people exhibiting no symptoms. Countries around the world had little notion of what was about to hit them. If the pandemic resulted from a lab leak in China, Beijing's culpability is even greater. The FBI, and the U.S. Department of Energy believe an accidental leak is more likely than not the way that this pandemic started. The Department of Energy, by the way, supervises our national labs and is arguably the most qualified U.S. agency to make a judgment about the origins of COVID. Beijing also bears some responsibility for the hundreds of thousands of Americans and Canadians who have died in recent years from illicit fentanyl the synthetic opioids that are exported here by Chinese state-owned enterprises or produced by Mexican cartels using Chinese precursor chemicals. Reporting by journalists at ProPublica shows that Chinese organized crime groups, which can operate only with Beijing's forbearance, are now the primary launderers of illicit drug money, drug money in North America. Then there's the unknown death toll from Beijing's crimes against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities inside China. Several democracies, including our own, have formally determined that Beijing is committing genocide. Genocide. Millions of people have been stuffed into concentration camps, sent into forced labor programs, and deprived of the ability to have children. For children already born, many have been taken from their parents and shipped off to squalid, government-run orphanages where they're indoctrinated to forget their language, their faith, and their families. 
These and related truths are going to be the subject of other panels at this great forum today. You've got a pretty excellent lineup of speakers who are going to give us ideas for how we should respond to the harm that Beijing is inflicting. But allow me to make one recommendation to the list of things that we should do. I think we should have a good laugh. No, really. I, I, I think that we should find the inspiration to laugh. And it's not that genocide and pandemics are funny. They're not. They're not any funnier than Hamas's terrorist assault and the intense suffering that that's brought to Israelis and Palestinians. It's not a laughing matter. But totalitarian systems, whether they are socialism with Chinese characteristics or Russia's blood-soaked reenactment of czarism or Iran's pseudo-religious terrorism franchise, all of these things are, let's face it, a little bit farcical. At the very least, these regimes and the humorless men that run them are worthy of our scorn, our satire, and yes, our laughter. So let me explain. The late Nobel Prize, no, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Liu Xiaobo once wrote, quote, I see political humor as an important and widespread form of popular resistance in post-totalitarian society. It played a similar role in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe before the great changeover that occurred there. Political satire in Chinese popular culture has shown a creativity, he said, and an authenticity that the solemn face of officialdom lacks. He continued, quote, the more serious the face of the government, the more people can only laugh. So what does this kind of political humor look like in practice in China? It's actually a pretty rich tradition. From folk rhymes and hilarious jingles, shuang kou liu, and that skewer pretentious officials, things like e gao, which is very loosely translated the sport of creatively lampooning bureaucracy and other daily indignities online. And I'll just give you a small but telling example. Today in China, typing the name of China's supreme leader on social media can be almost impossible without getting censored. As a result, there's a cat and mouse game that requires ever more ingenious nicknames for Xi Jinping. Some refer to him as Baozi or steamed bun uh, after he made a choreographed visit to a food stall early in his tenure. But now steamed bun is an illicit term that can subtly vaporize like the steam from buns uh, when you write that word in sentences, even if you're not referring to Xi. Lately, Xi Jinping has been referred to as that person, na ge ren, and quote, a guy in Beijing, Beijing mo nan zi, and also as you know who, Xi. He's even called simply, if somewhat ambiguously, him, ta. <laughs> Some netizens tried to get around the censors by submitting uh, substituting numbers for letters, calling Xi 11, because that's what his surname would spell if it were a Roman numeral. That worked until it didn't. And then people started to use 242, 242. And that's because it represents the Mandarin language tones that accompany the Chinese characters to Xi Jinping's name. So think about that. This would sort of be like the equivalent of writing you know, Morse code to approximate the number of syllables for Joe Biden. So even so, the Chinese censors eventually caught on and banned those numbers too. So writing numbers online in China can be quite risky since so many combinations add up to dates when atrocities were committed by the Chinese Communist Party. Just a few weeks ago, China had to expunge from the internet a very nice photograph of two Chinese athletes at the Asian Games hugging each other to celebrate a victory. The problem was that one of them had the number six on her uniform, the other had the number four, so when they stood together, it read like 6-4, June 4th, the date of the Tiananmen Massacre back in 1989. Even writing 89 can get you into choppy waters in China. 
So when I think of Chinese censors, I'm reminded of the Syrian officials who early on in Assad's war against his own population had to scurry around picking up hundreds of ping pong balls that protesters would roll down hilly streets in Damascus. The balls had anti-regime slogans written on them. So there's a little bit of a comic symmetry here. In an Arab dictatorship, officials run around hiding ping pong balls, while in China, censors run around hiding Arabic numerals. Satire is a form of resistance featured during China's draconian zero COVID lockdowns, particularly last year, 2022. And that satire appeared to have contributed in some way to Xi Jinping's ultimate decision to abandon that, that policy. In Shanghai, for example, there's a young cinematographer who was driven to the limits of his sanity by the incessant bedtime recorded announcements that echoed through his apartment and through his whole neighborhood, summoning people to report for daily COVID tests. So he decided to run an experiment. He typed out the text of dozens of these official announcements, and then he ran them through Google's random generator to scramble the words into entirely new and utterly nonsensical phrases. He then recorded and broadcast this gobbledygook, purely nonsensical phrases, throughout his neighborhood on loudspeakers. <clears throat> his neighbors were so conditioned to tune out the inane real-world announcements that they didn't notice that the filmmakers' official sounding announcements were in fact total gibberish. That video he posted uh, uh, online and it quickly garnered cheers and, and approval across uh, the Chinese web, according to a New York Times account. Chinese netizens don't have a monopoly on political satire, of course. When the dour and bloodthirsty regime in Iran boasted that its cabinet members had more PhDs than their US government counterparts, Iranian citizens responded that in Iran, PhD must stand for past high school with difficulty. <laughs> I'm optimistic that there is subversive satire occurring even in despotic outer planets like North Korea. Although I have to confess that I had trouble finding any, any evidence of humor while I was preparing this speech. So if we can't laugh with the North Korean people, we should at least laugh on their behalf as their proxies. Mm -hmm. Chinese netizens do sometimes step up and serve as proxies for the gag masses of North Korea. In a phrase on the Chinese internet that skewers the regimes in Pyongyang and Beijing simultaneously, Chinese netizens refer to China as Xi Chaoxian, West Korea. So Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel laureate, cautions that we should be on guard against letting satire breed uh, cynicism, but he says the risks of, quote, parody, mockery, ridicule, and insolence towards the state are, on balance, worth the costs. They're a powerful form of resistance. He said, quote, satire of what is wrong implies that something else is right. Satire tears down for the sake of rebirth. So we should laugh at totalitarian regimes, <clears throat> laugh with those who are living under those regimes, and in places that lack even an ounce of freedom, we should laugh on behalf of those who can't laugh for themselves. There are corners of the world so dark where the concrete cell floors are so thick that even humor can't sprout, but rather it goes dormant like grass in winter. The Uyghur poet Tahir Hamut Izgil described in a recent interview his journey step by step into deeper and deeper persecution and repression in Xinjiang until finally he was locked up in a Chinese labor camp. Quote, after the mass internments began, Tahir said, we felt humor was lost. It was even hard to imagine beautiful things like writing poetry. In that nearly hopeless situation, he said, we chose silence. Now, Tahir eventually got out and immigrated to the United States. And he said his ability to experience humor gradually blossomed again. Humor, he said, quote, gives reality back to us. Reality is what an oppressive government is afraid of, close quote. 
Liu Xiaobo knew what those darkest corners of human existence were like. He was jailed repeatedly, and for more than a dozen years in all, as punishment for his clear and beautiful writing about human dignity and the need for a Chinese system of government that protects that dignity with rights. In 2017, Liu Xiaobo became the only Nobel Peace Prize winner ever to die while a political prisoner. The first was Karl von Osiecki, who the Nazis arrested for his journalism exposing Hitler's secret military buildup. Leo wrote that, quote, some people say that political humor tore the Iron Curtain down. This may be giving it a, too, a bit too much credit, he said, but there can be no doubt that truth telling and joke making have worked hand in hand to dismantle post-totalitarian dictatorships. A recent example of truth tellers and joke makers working hand in hand and making a difference occurred just last year. The truth teller was Peng Li Fa. Peng Li Fa, a brave man who dressed like a construction worker one October day and hung a banner on a Beijing overpass that called for an end to zero COVID and the beginning of political change in China. Peng, who was nominated last week by the two congressmen that you just saw on the screen for a Nobel Peace Prize, was detained on the spot and hasn't been heard from since. Then there were the joke tellers of a sort. By last November, people were fed up with being confined to their homes like zoo animals under that zero COVID policy. Then after a deadly fire ripped through a lockdown apartment block in the city of Urumqi, street protesters erupted in numerous, street protests erupted in numerous cities with students and other citizens chanting slogans targeting the central government. The last time that happened was probably three decades earlier in 1989. The joke was the symbol they chose for their protests. They simply held up blank sheets of paper. This was a brilliant use of satire. The protesters didn't need to say anything in order to say everything. Jimmy Lai, another brave political prisoner sitting in solitary confinement right now in Hong Kong on preposterous charges, helped to expose something that Beijing hopes few other people inside and outside of China stop to ponder. The Chinese Communist Party claims to speak for all its citizens all the time on all matters. But Jimmy pointed out that people have a God-given will of their own. He's a living embodiment of that fact. And as he used to put it, quote, just because you make all the shoes, doesn't mean you own all the feet. That's satire of the most dangerous kind. As the Renaissance philosopher and Catholic Saint Thomas More once put it, the devil, the devil, that proud spirit cannot endure to be mocked. Thank you.